Good evening, and welcome to Salina League of Women Voters Primary Candidate Forum. Um, my name is Lori Tro, and I am president of the Salina League of Women Voters. And I appreciate all of you coming. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Amy Adams, our moderator, and she's going to go over all the information about how the forum is going to work, and then we'll start with questions and um, we'll get started. Thank you, Lori. All right. Um, so tonight's forum is sponsored by the Salina League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan, not for profit organization. It features candidates running for local office in the August 2nd election. We want to make sure everyone understands that the August 2nd election is not only a primary election, the constitutional amendment concerning abortion is on the August 2nd ballot. And every registered voter in Kansas, whether a member of any part, party or no party, is eligible to vote on that issue. July 12th is the final day to register for that election. You can register at ksvotes.org. We urge everyone eligible to vote, eligible voter to register by July 12th, and every registered voter to vote, either in advance or on August 2nd. We would like to thank the organizations are help, who are helping to uh, record this event for future posting and broadcast. Salina Media Connection and Smoky Hills Public uh, Television out of Bunker Hill. Uh, we will also be showing the uh, forum on Facebook at Smoky Hills PBS Facebook, as well as the League of Women Voters dash Salina Campus. You can also find it on youtube.com slash Salina Media Connection. Thanks to the Salina Public Library for making this space available, and thanks to Leslie Eichelberry from Salina Post for assisting with questions. Thanks to the candidates and the audience members for attending, and thanks to the members of the Salina League of Women Voters, all of whom are volunteers. Our first session features candidates for Saline County Commission, District 5. District 5 is generally the northwest section of the county, plus various parts of the city of Salina. The district map is linked at the league website, lwbsalina.org, on the elections page. The candidates for District 5 include, in alphabetical order, Randall Hardy, Joe Hay, and Mike White. Mike White is not with us, but we do hope do have Mr. Hay and Mr. Hardy. We will start with opening uh, statements of one minute each. We have a timekeeper who will show a yellow card at 30 seconds and a red card when time is elapsed. We will begin with Mr. Hardy, one minute for his opening statement. Thank you, and thank you for the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. It's a great event, and I'm glad to see so many people here tonight. Once again, my name is Randall Hardy, and I have been a Salina resident for 42 years. I know you don't believe that. But, uh, during that time, I served as city commission uh, from 2013 through 2016 and the Kansas Senate uh, from 2017 through 2020. That experience has given me a unique, unique set of skills and knowledge to enable me to succeed as county commissioner. Most people who run for local government are nice guys and gals. I am a nice guy, but I get things done. And I did, both on the city uh, and state levels. Feel free to ask for examples. I have experience working with government and business officials all over Kansas. That experience might provide a foot in the door for jobs or other benefits to Saline County. I look forward to working hard for the people of Saline County and I would appreciate your vote on August 2nd. Thank you. Next one minute for Mr. Hayes opening statement. Hi, I'd also like to thank the League of Women Voters. Again, my name is Joe Hay Jr. I'm running for the Saline County Commission District 5. I'm a 50 year plus citizen of Saline County and Salina. My wife, Mary, and I have 15 grandchildren and three great grandchildren. And I've served the great city of Salina as a city commissioner and presently serve as the chair for the city planning commission. I am a member of the Sacred Heart uh, Catholic Church and a 60 year member of the Boy Scouts of America and also a member of the Knights of Columbus and the Salina Breakfast Sandbucks. 
with the economy the way it is now, we need to be more careful with the, our taxpayers' money. I have some ideas that I have for this and for this issue, and hope that you'll let me show you what those are. Salinas future depends on it, and so does Saline County. Thank you. We will now allow uh, questions from Ms. Eichelberry from Salina Post. After that, we will take questions from the audience. So please be thinking of questions to ask that apply to both candidates and have not already been asked and answered. The candidates will have just one minute for each answer. Thank you. All right, guys. What do you believe is the most urgent need for Saline County? And if you are elected, what would you do to alleviate that or get us to that point, depending on whether it's positive or negative? Either one of them. Can we go first? Then? Sure, sure. You know, I think one of the most urgent needs for Saline County right now is with the economy the way it is, with the gas prices, the food prices, and everything up, we need to take a look at our budget that we've got. We also need to take a look at uh, some of the other things that Saline County uh, is faced with. Uh, I think we need to look at shared services for uh, Saline County, uh, using uh, shared services through the, uh, the city. Uh, I think we need to be more vigilant with our money and make sure that whatever, instead of having once, we need to look at the needs of Saline County. All right, thank you. Um, this is a, a really um, unusual time for our, our city and our county and our state, actually, because of uh, we're coming out of this COVID pandemic and we're coming out not knowing exactly uh, what's going on and, and where we're going to land. And I think that uh, one thing that I would like to see is capitalize on number one is housing. In the city of Salina, there's a severe need for um, affordable housing. Uh, to to house quality jobs that I'd like to work on uh, to bring to uh, Salina and Saline County. Uh, I, I would like to um, work with uh, the city officials and uh, county officials as well uh, as, a, as a partnership. And that's that's where coming from the city uh, commission may, may make a difference uh, to to bring uh, good jobs to uh, Saline County. We're, we're you know we're already partway there because of the uh, recession. Uh, and uh, and the and the lack of labor to give us <laughs> better paying jobs. That's okay. Thanks. Um, well, Mr. Hardy, you kind of answered my next question, okay. but maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. Um, what do you see the county's role in um, helping with the housing issue and with the bringing in commerce? I think the, the county uh, has a lot of uh, say with, uh, the, on the job side of it because there are a lot of uh, manufacturing uh, types of uh, businesses that prefer to be uh, where there's more real estate. And uh, so I think that the county would, would play a bigger part there and I would, uh, I have some resources, in fact my contact list uh, is very big now that I've been in the Senate and on the commission. And, and I think I would be able to uh, work with other people to uh, bring interest and uh, to to our uh, county and to our city, and for potential uh, quality jobs for for the for the county. And uh, I think uh, that is that's probably the, uh, the the largest part. The housing part, uh, you know, there's always annexation going on, so that would that would play into the, the equation as well. Okay. Well, you know, uh, I agree with uh, Senator Hardy, what ex Senator Hardy, uh, former, former. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Saline County plays into a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of area out there for housing. There's a lot of different places. One thing that I do think that the city and this and this uh, the Saline uh, the Saline County commissioners we need to get together. You know, it's always been that button heads, and we've never seen be able to have to be on the same page a lot of times uh, to solve a lot of these problems on housing jobs and everything if both entities get together and work together I think that we can uh, we can work out a lot of those 
Um, for quite a while now, there's been talk about the brain drain in Kansas and young people leaving the state and that we need to keep them in the state. Do you see it as part of Saline County's role to, to help keep people in the state and, and any, in the county itself? If so, why? I, I think it is. I, you know, we do see a lot of our younger people leaving. And, uh, you know, we need to retain uh, and retention those young people to stay in Saline County, go to school, come back in, help build Salina and Saline County. Uh, we need to make sure that we've got, uh, number one, the good the housing form to be in. We've got to make number two, we've got to make sure we got jobs for them. Uh, and we've got to make sure they're good paying jobs. If we have the housing and the jobs and the places for our kids and our grandkids to come back to, I think we can retain them. I think that one place where we can do a lot better um, in, uh, in retaining our, our youth uh, is with uh, better access to the internet. And uh, when I was uh, in the Senate, I served on the, the, the Utilities Committee, and so I, I was uh, introduced to a lot of different things that are, that are available that we may or may not be taking care, uh, advantage of right now. There are ways to provide internet, especially in the rural parts of the county, uh, that, uh, that are pretty cheap and reasonable and fast, and uh, I, I don't know that you know they're being promoted. I haven't seen advertisements anywhere about it anyway. But anyway, I, I think that if we provided um, a, a better hookup for the people all over the county, then we would be able to provide uh, options for them so they could you know work from home, uh, you know doing doing all kinds of business. My my younger son has his own business on his computer, so I know it's possible, and uh, it would be good to have. One more. Assuming you win and you go through your term, you decide, I, I, you know, I have other things I want to do, play with my grandkids, whatever. Looking back on your term, what do you hope to be remembered for and why? I would, um, uh, every, every role I've, I've served in, I only had one thing in mind, and that is to make life better for the people back in the city or in the state. Um, I wanted um, people to, uh, wanted to keep people, wanted to make life better for people. Uh, one, one thing I did in the, on the city commission, you know, you walk up and down downtown sidewalks, you see out, outdoor tables and people having a glass of wine with their meal. That was my ordinance that made that happen. And this was before the pandemic, so we didn't know how important that kind of thing might be. But it's now, it's now law. And, and so I, I just like, I think about things and I said, well, how can I make life better for people here? Give, let's give them options. Uh, that, that's why, you know, I want them to have a choice uh, on August 2nd. So that, that's what I would like to think. I would like to see that, you know, that people look back and say, you listen, he understood what we were trying to, uh, trying to tell him. He understood what we wanted, and he tried to do what was right and what was best. I want my grandkids to look back and say, you know, my grandpa was a city commissioner. My grandpa was a county commissioner. He made a difference in the city of Salina. And uh, during my two terms at, the, you know, my term at the city commission, I felt that I made a uh, made a, a difference. And I feel that I can make a difference with the uh, with the county. Uh, we've got so many things going on that we can do to make you know make it positive. So that's you know I want to be able to say people look back and say he did make a difference. We will now take questions from the audience. Uh, so please raise your hand if you have a question. I will call on you and repeat the question so that those watching remotely. Here. Um, speak there, loud. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. There. Say more. Yes. Uh, talking about affordable housing, I'd like to know what you consider affordable. Like for me, I make thirteen fifty a month. What is affordable? Ask the candidates to define what they consider uh, affordable housing. 
Mr. Hay. Okay. You know, right now, I don't think there's a such thing as affordable housing. I mean, if you look at the prices of lumber, the prices of, you know, everything, uh, affordable housing uh, is just out of sight. Uh, you know, if you would have asked me that two years ago, I, you know, I would have said affordable housing, finding, you know, you know, some place where you would be able to, to live, some places where, you know, you would be able to, uh, uh, you know, be able to own your own car, places to be able to go places and everything. Uh, affordable housing today, uh, unless we get the, the high prices of lumber and the high prices of, uh, you know, that kind of stuff down, affordable housing is going to be tough. Um, you know, I, I think uh, some of the some of the prices that we're seeing are a result of uh, the pandemic, and I think that you know, like the lumber prices, I think they're starting. They peaked and they're starting to come down now. But uh, what I would like to see is uh, something where I'd call affordable, like ninety grand. I don't know if that sounds reasonable to everybody or not. Okay, uh, but it's cost without rent. Oh, uh, it would be that would be about nine hundred. 800 somewhere in there but what what i'm thinking of is not traditional housing i'm thinking of something uh, i would call tiny homes uh homes that are you know 400 to 700 square feet uh that are that have small yards but are attractive and comfortable and air conditioned uh that would provide um you know housing at a reasonable cost and plus you can fit a bunch of them in uh, a residential lot we don't have to we don't have to do all this greenfield for something like tiny houses we can take a, a vacated block uh, in downtown like the one behind uh Salina regional and, and do something with, with it like that other questions from the audience uh, both of you have served on the city commission now you're looking at county commission uh, I think Mr. Hay mentioned it already. There is a divide between city commission and county commission. What are a couple specific ideas that you would have to bridge that divide between city and county so that they can work together better? Mr. Barber has asked about bridging the divide between the city and county governments. I think there's an obvious uh, solution to that, and that is to have some sort of regular get-togethers and it, it doesn't have to be in a formal setting necessarily but it would have to be you know let's get together and just get to know each other a little better instead of having walls that divide you buildings that divide you uh, be in the same room and and talk about some of the the issues it, it, you'd be probably be surprised how uh, you, you start finding synergies uh, between the two bodies of government and I think that uh, that's that's something that I would be interested in and doing also I think we need we have a transparency problem and it's not necessarily uh, on purpose but without the Salina Journal that's why everybody's here because they're not gonna read about this in the paper tomorrow and and so I think we have to be better at communicating uh, not just with each other you know city and county but also with the citizens of, of, the, of the city and the county communication 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 I mean, if you guys can't, we can't meet in the middle, and we can't talk, and we can't sit down, and we can't agree on things, it's never going to work. I think that with the commission that we've got now in the city and the commission that is currently serving, and uh, I would say with either one of us, is be able to sit down with the city and work out the differences. There's all kinds of stuff out there. I talked about shared services. Uh, you know, we, City of Salina has got so many things that the county could work off of in the same way with the county and the city. Uh, they just need to get together and they need to communicate. Uh, when I was in the, uh, on the city commission, we had a couple of meetings with the county. I thought they were really good meetings. We tried to work stuff out on the Expo Center. Of course, that drug on for months and months. But all you have to do is sit down and reach a happy medium. Mr. North. To follow up on the housing question, uh, when I was on the Planning Commission, Gary in the Planning Department at the time had been examining partnerships with some of the major uh, businesses in town. I have in mind Schwann's, for example, not the only example, but they're bringing 
how many hundreds of jobs, certainly more than 100 new jobs to town, increasing the stress on the housing market and the need for their employees. Do either of you see any way to, I don't want to say put pressure on, but to work cooperatively with the businesses that hire the most people in order that they might bear some of the cost, perhaps buy other houses, perhaps add a rent supplement, that kind of thing, rather than it all falling on the taxpayer, because as you say, Mr. Hay, reducing the tax burden is part of it. The question was uh, uh, working collaboratively with businesses to meet the housing needs. That's happening right now. Uh, the city commission has been meeting uh, uh, along with uh, and been communicating with the uh, planning commission. Uh, they've talked to Swans, they've talked to Great Plains, they've talked to, uh, I believe it's Aviation One, and all of those entities are really interested in trying to figure out a way that they can get housing in Salina. I know Aviation One is wanting to add lots of jobs, so is Great Plains, but as long as we don't have the housing, they can't do it. So the city has been working with, you know, and, and talking to these different places, and I think that's what we need to do as a county and the city both is just keep on talking to these these places, see what kind of uh, collaboration we can get with them. I, I think we're moving forward. We got some stuff in the in the works. We got a lot of housing coming up, and I think it's uh, you know it's going to be a good deal for the city of Salina and the Saline County. Is there any commitment from those businesses financially for that to happen? I don't. I, I can't answer that question about financially. I know there's commitment to work with us or work with them. All right, I remind the audience not to answer or ask follow-up questions. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Where's the fun in that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think uh, partner, you know, partnerships have, have been part of our fabric uh, forever. Uh, with, with, well, that's the way we're getting downtown developed. Uh, we're, uh, we're working with, with local businesses. Housing would be an extension of that, and I, but I see that if these companies are interested in bringing people in, they know uh, what the housing situation is and they would not uh, want to uh, cost themselves money uh, by not being able to afford house, uh, provide housing for their employees that they can actually afford. So I think that um, it, it's an advantage for um, businesses to come to uh, you know, county government or city government or both and, uh, and try to work out uh, some sort of uh, partnership uh, to make the housing, you know, whether it's the tiny homes or whatever, uh, to be, be innovative, be creative, think out of the box, and, uh, you know, let's make, some, make, a, make people happy. Yes. There's been quite a bit of discussion about the housing market and the reports are that some of the homeless have been showing uh, residents that have dealt with them downtown that a judge has told them to come to Salina and also that they are being dumped at the county line from another county. Uh, do you guys work with the sheriff's department to kind of control these homeless that are coming into our, our county? Uh, if the other counties don't want them, why should we have to take them? The question was regarding the homeless population in the county and working with the sheriff's department to address that issue. Uh, the homeless will always be with us. I think that's even biblical, <laughs> the poor. And, uh, and so that, uh, you know, I think that we're, not, we're never going to get to zero homeless people in Saline County. We are in the perfect place in the country for the homeless. We're at the intersection of two major interstate highways. Uh, they're likely to get here. I've, I've heard they even have little books that tell them where to go to get the best medical care and where to find uh, food and all that sort of thing too. And, and we're featured prominently uh, in that publication. I think what we need to do is figure out ways that we can be um, compassionate and, and make sure they, whether they can, can uh, go to one of our facilities that, you know, where, where there's room for them. Uh, I don't think that the answer is to, and, and find jobs for them, frankly. Uh, I, don't, I don't think the answer is to uh, just take them to the next county line. Uh, that, that doesn't solve anything. That's a problem. It's a big problem in Saline County and in Salina. If you go up on North Broadway, underneath the bridge on North Broadway up there, 
I mean, it's, it's like a tent city up there. Uh, some of those people want to be homeless, some of them don't. We, like he said, we need to be compassionate. We need to, uh, you know, they're, like he said, they're never going to go away. We need to work more with uh, uh, our services we have in town. Uh, the rescue mission, the rescue mission has been really, really good about trying to help. Uh, the Sling County Sheriff, uh, they patrol that area quite extensively. Uh, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, that we're not letting, um, you know, if, if it is, if we are getting people in, we need to make sure that we stay on top of it and make sure that we take care of I mean, they are our citizens too. They may not spend as much money as we do, so, but they still are our citizens. So we need to, you know, figure out a way with the churches okay. and things around to look, to help them out. Okay. What in general do you believe is the role of government and where does the county government play in that? In the homeless? No, oh. the role of government okay. in general and the county government under that. Well, the county, uh, the county government, you know, they overlook, you know, the county maintenance. Uh, they overlook, uh, you know, the election, the county attorney, emergency management, the uh, senior services, uh, district courts. I mean, uh, community corrections. Uh, they play a big part in keeping those uh, those entities funded and going. Uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, else in there, you know, like I said, the roads, the bridges, county maintenance. Mm -hmm. Mr. The, uh, the, yeah, the county, um, you know, we have, we have the city and we have the county. And they, when I was on the city commission, we did have one thing that we jointly funded, and that was the city county health department, which now belongs to the county alone. And, and I think that's, that's fine. I, I, was, I was okay with that. Uh, but I, I think that we do have uh, distinct functions that work best uh, for either the city to perform or for the county to perform. And, uh, and the system we have, I think, uh, is pretty doggone efficient uh, in getting things done and, and making sure all the, all the cogs and the wheels are working properly. You know, like with the, the COVID epidemic, uh, the city really appreciated the county giving us uh, constant feedback on where <coughs> Saline County was with with the pandemic. Back to that sort of thing. Yes, in the back. Yes, I have a question about the um, tax, the uh, housing appraisals. I was shocked to find that mine went up like forty thousand dollars. And so, with that, could you explain to me, each one of you, how that works and what I would assume be a, a revenue jumper? What would you do with that extra money if, there, if it was extra? So the question was about housing appraisals, which have recently gone up, and they're asking the candidates to explain how that works and how the revenue is used. Um, start with Mr. Hart. Well, the, um, <clears throat> this is something that, that is kind of a, a bug for me, too. I don't, I don't really like what the way things happen. Um, when I was on the city commission, um, I, it took me a while to sink in to understand what was happening, but, but what happens is when your valuation goes up, your taxes are based on what they call a mill levy, right. and and the mill levy then uh, is is based on that. And so if your the value goes up and then the mill levy goes up, uh, the the city or the county then gets a free raise, and and I think that uh, that should uh, be reversed. Uh, I I think that once we have a a budget set and that uh, we know what things uh, are costing us, that we should not uh, penalize the homeowner just because they were fortunate enough to have the value of their home increase. I think that then we should look at the mill, that mill, mill levy and, and hopefully bring it down uh, instead of uh, leaving, even leaving it the same so that we're more fair to the, the citizens of the, the county. And yes, and like I said, the mill levy I feel right now is way too high. With the way the mill levy is now, and like you said, when the appraiser goes in and takes a look at that and your housing goes up and not only does your your housing go up a lot of other things go up along with that i think what we need to do is we need to step in and when i look when i said earlier about the budget we need to take a look at the budgets and we need to we need to find out what the needs are and not the wants because a lot of the wants that we've got is what's bringing up the higher taxes and, the, and on that. So we need to take a look 
at what the needs are and not the wants. All right, we have time for one final question, and I saw this gentleman with his hand raised. To what, <clears throat> to what extent is the current expo center, that whole complex, being funded by taxpayer dollars today? Do either of you know what that amount might or might not be? The question was about the expo center and to what extent it is being funded by tax dollars. Um, Mr. Hay, I'll go to you first here. <laughs> you know, I, I, I cannot answer on what, how much is, fun, you know, the expo center is funded. Uh, I do know that uh, since, you know, a lot of the, you know, since they got rid of the rodeo grounds and some of the stuff that they're doing, a lot of the taxpayer money uh, that's coming in on taxes and stuff is being used for the renovation. Uh, they've done a lot of work. They've got new windows. They got new fans. They got new. I think they got a new uh, warm-up arena and different things like that. But uh, you know, I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you what exactly that that dollar amount is. It took me all the way till today to find out where the budget is on the county website. This is another part about transparency that I'm, uh, I would like to see worked on. Uh, so I, I have not been able to go through the, the budget line, line item by line item, uh, but it's not, I would say it's just guessing, it's, it's not a significant amount of the, uh, the budget, uh, and, and a lot of it can be planned for. Um, you know, the, uh, the county knows that uh, they're responsible for that portion of the facilities yeah. that uh, fall under their, uh, their guard. All right, we will now have a one-minute closing statement from each candidate, uh, beginning with Mr. Harvey. Thank you once again for, for coming out. Uh, one thing we did, really didn't talk about a lot, I, I have a few priorities that I was wanting to uh, talk about. I, I think that we could find lower property tax uh, solutions for Saline County by looking at more efficient ways of doing things. Uh, when I was on the city commission, the, the, the Salina Field House, we got a, a, a bid of $12 million for a contractor to bid it, uh, build it. And I said, that sounds like a lot of money. So I found another contractor from Southeast Kansas uh, that provided that uh, building for nine and a half million dollars. I think we can do stuff like that. I think I, I was in the highway business for 30 years. I, uh, good roads are big on my agenda. And I want to make sure that the county has uh, the best roads uh, out there, quality jobs, better communication and transparency between county government and um, uh, citizens, and um, better and cheaper internet options for all of our citizens. Those would be the things that I would be uh, looking at. Mr. Banker, please. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank the uh, League of Women Voters for this. Uh, you know, there is a couple of priorities I would like to see, too. Uh, I'd like to see the senior services budget increased uh, with so many senior citizens in town now. I think that uh, they need to look out for us a little bit. I would like to see the sheriff's department a little bit uh, better staffed and uh, equipped. Uh, uh, housing, jobs, and trying to get the taxes down in Saline County. Again, August 2nd is coming up. I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you. We will now take a short break to switch to the Democratic race for House 69, House District 69, the Republican race for House District 107, and the Republican race for State Board of Education District 7. And they're seating up here for those of you that are from different offices, um, and two from one office, okay. <laughs> I had to do the math really quick in my head. For the candidates who could not attend or did not respond, we offer to allow them to submit a written statement or send a representative. We will introduce them in order of their district numbers. For the new State Board of Education, District 7, we were formerly in District 6, we have incumbent Republican Ben Jones. His opponent, uh, Dennis Hirschberger, is attending an event in Great Bend tonight and has submitted a written statement. I'm an unapologetic conservative who wants to see K-12 
K through 12 education reined in from destru destructive policies that are putting children at risk from receiving a good education that is robbing them of fundamental skills and the three R's. This is being done by using curriculum that is social emotional based and exposing them to illicit sexually a sexuality that is very inappropriate and at times initiated without parental or legal guardian knowledge. Transgender trends are simply destroying the roles of male and female, creating confusion and causing a level of hopelessness not seen in our history. I fear this trend will lead to relationship issues that separate children from reality and destroy the traditional family model with sterility and even suicide escalating in the aftermath. Data collection has robbed class time to teach and is being used to give private information to cultural elites intending to promote socialism ideology, most of what parents and even educators have not been informed of. I'm concerned the end game is to create a cultural dependent on big brother tech and government. And at that, I have reached time on the statement. That was from Dennis Hirschberger. Okay. Um, all right, from the Democratic race, uh, from House District 69, we have Sarah Cruz and Molly Molina. And from the Republican race for House District 107, we have incumbent Susan Concannon from Beloit. Her opponent, Gerald Johnson of Glasgow, has 4-H events with his children tonight, so he could not attend. He declined to send a statement or representative. Links to the maps showing the boundaries of these districts are available at lwbsalina.org on the elections page. We will start with opening statements of one minute each. As a reminder, we have timekeepers. When you see the yellow card, that means you have 30 seconds remaining, and the red card means your time is ended. All right, we will start at this end of the table with Ms. Molina. Well, I'm Molly Molina, and I'm running for the 69th District. The reason I did it was because me and my friends had started getting into politics more, and I realized no one had gone for it, and we all took kind of like this inner vote between us that someone should step up, that we don't see any young women going up for this. There are some, but we just don't see it being pushed hard enough. It felt like our voices weren't being heard, and I guess I was the one that fell and got pushed into it. So this is a really good learning jump for me and process. So I really hope you guys give me a chance to feel heard and let my friends and other acquaintances, coworkers feel heard. I want to let their priorities be known, and that's what I want to focus on is from housing, um, minimum wage, um, education, food. There's a lot of things I feel like that needs to be called out on, and it's hard to like try to describe it in one minute. But there's a lot that I want to talk about. All right, Ms. Cruz. Thank you. I'm Sarah Cruz, and I want to start by thanking the League of Women Voters for um, holding this forum. A little bit about me. I've been politically active my whole life in that I have exercised my right to vote in every local and, and national election. I'm a relative newcomer to Salina, having moved here just 10 years ago. I have a background in aging and end of life, and since arriving, I have taught classes and workshops in death and dying and after death care here at the library through the class program at Kansas Wesleyan, at Bethany College, at K-State, and also at KU, along with um, teaching hospices in the region. I've also founded a nonprofit natural cemetery just north of here. One of the things I took to heart is that anyone in this country can run for public office, and hardly anyone does. Given the political climate these days, I felt it was my time to rise to the occasion and get involved and I would like to be uh, represent the people of the 69th district. Ms. Tim Cannon. Well, thank you, and thank you to the uh, League of Women Voters. Um, uh, so I'm Susan P. Cannon. I'm new to Salina politics, but I'm not new to Salina, and I'm not new to politics. Um, I was born and raised here. I grew up out on Simpson Road, east of Salina. I was in the Willing Workers 4-H Club and went to Emanuel Lutheran Church. Um, I went right away from Central in 1976. Um, politically, I've served on the city council in Beloit, uh, which is where I currently live now, I should mention that, um, and then I ran for the house in 2012. So 
So I have been in the Kansas House for 10 years. Uh, redistricting then brought me back to my roots in Salina. Uh, they, they created a district that drops clear down and I've got the northwest uh, corner of rural Saline County and, and a section of Salina. Uh, I live in Beloit. My husband's a physician. We've been married 42 years. Uh, we have three children, my grandchildren. <laughs> and Mr. Jones. Well, thank you. It's such a cool day in Kansas to be here, right? As we're all melted walking in here. Uh, my name is Ben Jones, and I'm the current District 7. Kansas State Board of Education representative. I sit alongside Dr. Dina Horst, who sits on District 6, which previously had Salina. And in redistricting, I've gained Saline County and the rest of Dickinson County, as well as a whole bunch of areas south and, and west. Uh, I am a resident uh, and a lifelong uh, family uh, roots in Sterling, Kansas, and rural Rice County. Um, I am the Director of Discipleship and Outreach with Lions First United Methodist Church. Uh, where I'm on staff, uh, as well as involved with uh, Family Community Theater in Hutchinson, where I'm the Vice President and Chair of their Education Committee, work on education initiatives and theater, as well as uh, uh, various odd jobs in the community um, in, in Reno and, and Rice Counties. Uh, the last four years, uh, I'm pleased to say that we have uh, improved graduation rates faster than any other state in the country, as well as post-secondary success. Students getting high school diploma, uh, High school diplomas, but as well as certifications uh, out there. It's, it's great to be here. I saw it was giving a nice ending. <laughs> we will now have questions for Ms. Eichelberry from Salina Post. She will begin with questions for the school board race and then move on to the house race. Thank you. Okay. You have some experience already. Um, Can you speak up, please? Uh, you have experience of being on the state board already. Um, what do you see as the greatest need for education in the state board? Yes, the uh, greatest need is, is twofold. One is uh, recovering from COVID. As you know, COVID shut down. I was in the classroom uh, the day that we did shut down. I'm a substitute teacher uh, as well. And um, it's, it's recovering that. So we, we did see a loss and a plateauing of graduation rates, post secondary success came out of COVID. Now, we did not lose ground in that, but our test scores did suffer. And so how do we catch those kids up, especially those kids that are identified with IEP and special needs, or, or, or those kids that are in poverty that now didn't have the resources necessarily during COVID to receive quality uh, education during that time that they were out of the classroom? Um, yeah, those are our two biggest challenges. Kind of along those lines, um, during the pandemic, or we're still sort of in it, um, a lot of schools switched to giving an online option, distance learning type of option, and in some cases has proved to be somewhat popular. What is your view on, on continuing to offer that? Yeah, uh, so roughly 25% of kids will be successful in education no matter what the delivery method. Traditional classroom, online, um, total virtual, homeschool, it really doesn't matter. It's so 75%, it's finding those pieces. A lot of families discovered that they like the freedom of having a virtual education, uh, which we've had in the state for a very long time, um, that it benefits their, their family needs, whatever they may be, whether they have family that stretch from coast to coast and they want to go see their family in California. Um, and, and kind of pick up whenever they go. So that it's a valid uh, platform for, for some families to choose and for some kids, not every kid. Some of the kids need that traditional brick and mortar uh, classroom setting that they can succeed in and that needs to be quality. And we have a lot of quality schools here in the state of Kansas and a majority of our schools, uh, districts in the state of Kansas were open in person pretty much throughout COVID with the exception of that last three months of 2020, but uh, in, 20, in the 21, 2021 school year. We're finding out who can follow the procedure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, school safety has been a big issue lately. How safe are Kansas schools and what else needs to be done to protect the students and staff? Yeah, we have, we have school safety uh, specialists on staff that do address this with schools and provide a good resource. 
we unfortunately had to utilize this year at a Lathan East High School, where we did have a school shooting. Thankfully, it was contained to that front office space and the kids never were impacted in terms of it hitting the hallways of the school. They were still impacted, of course. And that goes with secure entrances, uh, school resource officers for those communities. Um, we have really, all those mitigation tactics that we put in at Olathe East, we found out worked because it kept the school shooting from, from happening uh, and worse. So keep doing that and encouraging our districts to look at ways to make their building safer because every building is unique to that building. And so the solutions need to be locally driven uh, and we provide that expert help to figure out how to, how to make that end meet. All right, housekeeper, are you ready? What do you see as the state's, as a whole, most urgent need going into, say, the next couple of years? Start with Ms. Kincaid. So it's, hard, it's hard to narrow that down to one. Um, uh, obviously, we've heard a lot of discussion today on housing, and uh, we've got I have to say one. Housing is a very urgent need. I do have some numbers on that. I've heard the discussion earlier and would like to share those. Um, I'm going to run out of time if I start getting into that. But workforce de development, child care, uh, those are all things that, um, that, that we need to be working on. Uh, we are doing well economically. We're coming, the, the um, revenues are coming in above expectations. But um, so, you know, at some point, I'd like to see an opportunity to lower taxes. Yes, Grace. Last Sunday, the Salina Journal published a three-page article on climate change and the effect that that is having on farmer, farming in Kansas. We can expect less consistent, more erratic, and intense weather events from deluge to drought. I would support research targeting crops and cropping systems that can deal with extreme climate conditions. I really believe that if you care about farmers, you need to be concerned about climate change because farmers are what make up the, you know, the majority of the, of the state. And um, it's something that we really need to be concerned about. Um, I would support continued expansion of renewable energy and infrastructure, including solar panels and wind turbines. Ms. Molina. For me, I was hoping this wouldn't be my top priority or concern, but it's um, uh, a right for our body um, because it, it was my focus on the school foods and we would be progressing and we weren't going to be falling back, but we are somehow. And that ruined a lot of me and my friends' ideas of wanting to do different things and trying to show people that, hey, we're going forward, hey, let's focus on these other things. But it seems like we're falling back in time and that's hurting a lot of us and then it's bringing up a lot of points that my friends didn't think was going to happen. What am I going to do with my body? What about birth control? What's happening? What happens if I get raped? What's going to happen if a family member, like they talked about that 10 year old. Um, that suddenly became really big. I wanted to focus on preschool lunches and I didn't realize it would become so dramatic on this second, um, on this boat, on Roy versus uh, Wade. So that's my biggest concern, making sure everyone's aware and that misinformation isn't being spread. What, um, <clears throat> uh, Medicaid expansion has been a hot topic, but for quite a while. Um, what are your thoughts about doing that in the state of Kansas and why? We'll start with this. Um, this is a pretty personal issue for me. I just got back from spending three weeks in um, Michigan uh, taking care of my cousin who lives in a trailer alone at the poverty level. And Michigan is one of the states, 38, that have um, accepted Medicaid expansion. And I actually find it unconscionable <laughs> that the state of Kansas is grappling so hard with this right now when the, the uh, um, you know, it would be paid for, 90% of it is paid for by the federal government and um, we need to really support people 
who need health care. Um, Barb got excellent health care because of Medicaid expansion in Michigan. And I, I think it's absolutely necessary. And if we want to be a compassionate state, as Richard Hardy was talking about, um, this, is, this is something that we really cannot fall short on. It's kind of the same thing. Um, well, I have my views, um, but uh, I don't know too much on it other than I would assume why wouldn't you expand on it? Why wouldn't you help people that need um, medical help? Why isn't that available? Like, there's a lot of things that need to be called out and a lot of things that need to be fixed. And it's odd that that is something that we are struggling so hard to do. It shouldn't be such a hard concern. Why is it so hard to just say, yes, let's just do this. Let's help these people that are in need. This affects a lot of things. Let's just do this. So, I, like I said, I'm still learning. I want to know more. But I do believe in expanding on it and making it easier for families, um, children, um, elderly people who are probably struggling, who have retired, who can't work anymore. I know that's still a struggle. So it's my statement for now until I learn more. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I strongly support uh, expanding Medicaid. Um, I have worked on that and advocated for it since 2013 when I first came into the House. Um, it, we are paying through the, for this through our income taxes to the federal level. And at once upon a time, that was going to our hospitals in the form of these dish payments. Uh, it's kind of more complicated than that, but at the time when we switched to the Affordable Care Act, uh, there was an expectation that we would expand and that, um, and that, that it would come through the state, but we didn't. Uh, then that's when the Supreme Court ruled that we didn't have to. So we are paying for it and then paying for it again through um, some of our communities that have to uh, pay for income, in, income tax increase. Um, I think that it protects, and it's, uh, we get the 90% coming in now, but also if we would come in now, we would get, <laughs> we, get we get a bonus of like 350 million. So it would be 100%. Assuming you are elected, or in your case re-elected, what do you want your legacy to be as a legislator? Start with Ms. Molina. Um, well, for me, this is just a big jump in learning, and I want to be more active. I feel like I don't see enough of someone from my working class that's struggling to just be able to stand on her own two feet and do something. I want to be able to provide for my family as well if something ever happens. Uh, my boyfriend or what happens if something happens to my mom I have to take care of two families because my, uh, my siblings are dependent on my mom still um, so there's a lot to this I feel like learning a lot of these political things can help me better understand it and to help better help my community my family my friends and to help them understand so that they can see that we can do this as a group as a community we can probably make this a lot better. I feel like we can if we work together, but it's hard. This is a big learning process for me. So I'm hoping I learn a lot. And for me, the legacy is that other people realize they can do this too. Thank you. Um, I guess I would like to be known as a pragmatic problem solver. Uh, I, I uh, worked a lot with different health issues. Um, just in the last three or four years, I've been working on foster care e issues and uh, senior care task force of so senior issues. I chair a committee called Children and Seniors, and I would like to be known as a very fair chairman. Um, and I, you know, that's in the end, at the end of the day, that's what we're there for is to try to work together and solve problems. And uh, that's that's what I would like to be known for. Ms. I'm I'm really interested in, in helping to protect the constitutional rights that are already in place in this state. And I feel like it's really important that we, we continue to uh, ensure that those freedoms and rights are, are accessed equitably and um, that, that it wouldn't be based on, you know, anyone's 
economic status or, or gender identity or sexual orientation or race, and, and rather that we will um, protect our constitutional rights. And so I guess that's part of what I would like to be remembered for as being a stout ward uh, protector of, you know, of upholding the Constitution rather than uh, changing, changing it to uh, limit people's rights. Thanks, Ms. Michael Berry, for your questions. We will now turn to questions from the audience. Um, we'll raise your hand and I will call on you. Um, ask your question. Please specify whether you are asking the question for the Board of Education race or for the House races. Um, remember to allow the candidates to answer the questions without interruption. Um, and I will now call on you to raise your hands in the front row here. Mine's to the Board of Education. What is your definition of CRT and is it being taught in K through 12? So critical race theory uh, by definition is a law school level theory that, that teaches um, well, I'm not a law student, nor did I go to law school, so uh, there's a law school um, uh, level course. I have a friend that teaches an hour of it in a three hour long course at K-State um, that touches briefly on it and moves on to other things. Um, it is currently not expected to be taught in our state standards. I've never voted to put it in there. I won't vote on there because it's not appropriate for our kids to do. It's a law school level course. This is for the state representatives. Um, recently, Salina, as part of our reporting to the state, became the first city to declare a target of zero waste by 2050. And it's a very big definition of zero. But I'd like to think under home rule we could carry that out. But the state has preempted or attempted to preempt home rule when they tried to ban plastic bags from being banned at municipalities. So my question for you is, what is your position on preemption, and when is it appropriate to do so? The question was related to the city's uh, desire to reach zero waste and- It's about home rule versus the state's ability to come in and preempt home rule. That, I gave an example of where we're using it. Okay, so the example you was using was about zero waste, but it is about home rule question and the state's ability to preempt that. Um, we will start with Ms. Kuhan. Okay, thank you. Um, so I I believe in local control. I you know have the background of being on city council in Beloit. Um, I think that, that the, the best decisions are made locally uh, for, for their community. If people know what's best for their area. I do think that there are some situations where the state can override that when it's a situation for um, a public health, as we just recently saw with the uh, pandemic. Um, but that's the only exception I can think of right at this time. Otherwise, it's local control. Ms. Cruz. I agree with uh, what Susan just said. I, I think it's really important that, that local uh, municipalities have decision-making uh, power uh, to do what is right for the cities. And again, I think that that's a great example that you gave um, about uh, healthcare and you know, especially getting through the pandemic was, um, and, and as has already been mentioned, we're still, we're still in the midst of it, um, although it seems like it has peaked. And um, yeah, and I guess another would be if, if a city was implementing a, a uh, program that was uh, marginalizing uh, certain groups of people in the city, that, that that might be a reason for the state to get involved. Ms. Leah. This is actually like new for me, so I don't actually have, I feel like, good enough answer but I do know like I feel like if a group of people in the community say hey we don't want this we want to go more with um, more economical more, or more environmental safe like thing then I can see how they should be in more control if they as a community are devoted to doing this then I think they should be allowed to do that from what I'm understanding kind of I still have a lot more to understand on that 
little complicated to me, but I haven't really heard of that until recently. So I want to work on that. Additional questions? Could I ask the state board a question? Certainly. What our, I guess our former board member, Dino Horace, fought rather strenuously to keep arts as a full credit rather than a half credit. Mm -hmm. What is your position on that? My background is music. <laughs> <laughs> I made a very long speech last month about the importance of the arts and how it ties to academic success. I will not be supporting reducing the arts credit to a half credit. Uh, in the back first. Uh, I'm a cybersecurity engineer, and so that's my background, science and technology. With that being said, how have you thought about, you know, progressing into more science in the STEM realm in the schools, K to 12, all? Okay. So the question was about expanding uh, uh, STEM programming in. Well. Yeah, um, so we have been working on in the last four years computer science standards. Uh, we didn't have them for a long time, or they weren't updated, we had them. But uh, we work very hard with code.org and, and a lot of uh, Kansas organizations and companies to, to institute them. And that, I've never worked on standards so long uh, than computer science because we wrestled with that for about six months, um, uh, which is a lot, as well as we reinstituted the computer science licensure. Uh, for teaching which hadn't been used since the 90s. So we are really transitioning into how do we deliver that, how do we integrate it in our classrooms, knowing that we don't have the knowledge of our teacher base to teach it fully at this point in time. Um, but we will build our capacity. We work with Chairman Hubert, uh, the chair of the House Education Committee, to, to start that work and investing in that, in that process with this computer science bill last session. And it was a compromise and a wonderful deal that we had worked out uh, between the state board and the legislature uh, just this year. Oh, that's a broad subject. We're talking about computer science. So within computer science, where have you leaned towards the most? Where have you grown the most or presented growth? I will say that we are at the very beginning uh, of that. Uh, so a lot of it is geared toward uh, coding. It's an easy, accessible uh, platform to go right now, uh, as well as in identification. You know, computer science is broad. I'm very well aware of it. It's housed within all of these different pathways that exist. And so how does this particular uh, STEM pathway, you know, how does this impact the certain pathway? So ag would be completely different from, um, uh, I'm blanking on all our pathways right now, uh, but uh, history of government or, or that, those kind of pathways or uh, audiovisual, it would be completely different. So it's adaptable to those pathways. Uh, in those programs, especially at the secondary level. Thank you. This would also be for Ben Jones. Uh, realizing that, that today's headline is that Kansas is facing its worst teacher shortage in 90 years, something like that, uh, certainly bad. Uh, <clears throat> you had uh, read the statement of your opponent in the race. I guess my question to you would be, do you find any part of his statement to be a concern that you would share enough that you would change voting patterns on the board? The question was regarding the, his opponent's statement that was read and whether that affects the teacher shortage. Is right? there any part of that statement that would change the way he's voted on the board? Would that his statement affect your voting? My, my voting is for my district. I've always had a conservative vote on the board, and it will stay that way. Um, he is one constituent of many. Uh, I've made a concerted effort in the last four years. Uh, I had 34 school districts in my area. I visited all 34 in my first year. Uh, that was a Herculean task. I didn't realize how Herculean it was, but it was. Especially when my district used to go out to Emporia and Junction City. Now it shifted from uh, Chapman, clear down to Coldwater, um, and out to Ness City. Um, and I'm, I'm making that same commitment now. It's communication, being out in the district. Uh, I put 130,000 miles in my car in four years. Um, and, and I'm in the classroom. I'm a substitute teacher. I know what's going on. So my votes have been conservative, but it's been reflective of, of what's happening in our schools and in, in our state. Other questions from the audience? 
this is from the Board of Education. I'm glad I'm so popular. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on our school board. And, uh, we are finding that when we focus on the Kansas and scan, um, whatever you call those, the yeah, all those focuses about uh, kindergarten readiness and uh, graduation rates and post high school success and social emotional and one other in the oh, IPS. Civic and IPS and civic engagement. Oh, uh, civic engagement too. And uh, we aren't teaching as much to the Kansas test, the exam that puts us, that comes up with a number for our district. And so um, some of our legislators are holding the number against us when we're making all these giant moves on, on all these issues uh, which involve, and, and our uh, strategic plan which em emphasizes understanding and curriculum and all this stuff. So um, I wondered if you are, have been discussing how to weigh the Kansas standards test against all these other things that we were working on. So the question is how to weigh that Kansas standardized test against all the other issues and metrics that they're working on. <laughs> so part of the Kansas Can vision is the holistic look at a kid. If you remember No Child Left Behind, everything was driven off one thing, test score. <coughs> we realize that that is not alone a definition of a successful student. Uh, I always go to, hey, when you get a job or when you get your first job, what's the question on the exam? Do you have a high school diploma? Yes. Does it say what you score in the Kansas State Math Assessment in eighth grade? No. Um, and, and so when we look at success for a student, it's more than a test score. It's all that and. So we talk about academic preparations at the very top of that, and that's kind of how we measure that is, is by that test score. But it's, it's looking holistically at the whole student and that the, and the student's not just defined by a test score. But it is, it is a challenging task. I will, it is. I know that. For senators, <coughs> um, <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'm thinking, yeah. Um, single most important issue, period, in terms of budget and budget resources. Single most important issue in terms of budget and budget resources. From from where do we start? Um, we'll start with Ms. Cruz. Yeah. Um, thanks for that question, Gary. Um, I I I have to admit I don't know a whole lot about the budget or the budget resources. Um, I do know that we have a, a tax revenue surplus now and now have uh, you know what a billion dollars or something in the in the rainy day fund um, so you know if this is a question about taxes um, you know I'm interested in, in tax equity I'm interested in, in getting the balance right between government services that people want and the amount of taxes that they're willing to or, or um, um, inclined to pay for that and I am particularly concerned about public education and making sure that we're funding um, public education well and uh, maybe increasing teachers' salaries if that's what it's gonna take to keep quality teachers here in our schools that want to stay here. Ms. Malia, I also don't know much about budgeting or much on the taxes, but I always thought a way to help boost um, money into the state would be to legalize marijuana, which I always assumed would help provide more jobs, more income. Um, then there's a tax on it that would go back into the state and for school and funding the teachers, funding food. I just assumed if you open up more opportunities, then a lot more opportunities should obviously open up as well. So that's as far as I know and like what I thought that was was increasing budget was meaning let's you know legalize something like marijuana let's start with that and see how that goes because i think other states have done it and they've done amazing things with those profits Ms. Yeah. Um so i i have the advantage of uh also 10 years of experience plus uh, i 
served on the Appropriations Committee for uh, six years. And um, when I came into the legislature, it was right after the Roundback tax cuts that that bill was just passed before I came in. So I lived through all of those cuts and how miserable that was. Um, <coughs> priority for me and has been for the last couple of years is paying off that debt. Clo we closed the bank of KDOT. We, uh, we are paying off bonds, all the ones that we, that we can and all the ones that make sense because of interest reasons. Um, the other thing is capers. We were skipping capers payments during that time. And we've stabilized. This, this year we were able to put a billion dollars into capers. And we went from 49% funding up to 89 um, and then the, we started the rainy day fund or stabilization fund uh, just last year. So, yeah. <laughs> we do have a time for one more question. Uh, there in the back. I want to ask, I'm going to end here. Um, as you grow and learn more and understand more and more about um, the effects of, of marijuana, and the fact that it's, a, it's a, a gateway drug that leads many people into more different, stronger drugs, and then that creates more of a problem in terms of addiction, which then is uh, ultimately um, a taxpayer issue. Um, I'm, I'm just astounded at, at when people want to use any kind of chemical like that to increase our funding uh, when, when from another standpoint, the psychological and emotional standpoint of possibility of people really getting. Can we rephrase the question so that it applies to all the, all the House candidates? My, my concern is the whole, the whole thing of um, legalized marijuana and um, not understanding that in a big, big picture that can lead to a lot more problems for our citizens in terms of addiction. It's a gateway drug for sure into to other drugs. Um, so I guess I'm not sure even what my question is except, except why would you want to, to use uh, something like that to make more money when in the big picture it harms, um, it harms people, it very well could harm people. So the question is, is in regards to um, potential fallout from uh, legalizing marijuana. And we'll start with Ms. Molina. For me to say that it's a, this big picture, I think it's been blown out of this proportion because I do remember it being drilled into me since elementary school here at Oakdale that, it is, that it's a big gateway, but it really wasn't to me. And I felt like um, this big picture that a lot of people have this image of legalizing. You're gonna start doing heroin, you're gonna start stealing, you're gonna start doing, that didn't happen until it became, to, to me, people tried it and, well, because it's illegal, people are getting punished for it. You have the one about the 18-year-old who got caught with it, and it, the judge had destroyed his life completely. And he didn't even have a chance to really live out his life. I think legalizing it is better. You, we gotta destroy this old image that it destroys lives when it really doesn't seem to be doing that to these other states, if they have it, I know it seems hard to jump in such a, to me, it, it seems like a common progressive idea to just be legal on it. Sorry, there's, it's a lot more in depth to me to talk about. There's a lot to it, sorry. Uh, so we've had some votes. I, I have a voting record for um, legalizing marijuana. I have supported uh, legalizing medical marijuana and uh, that passed the House and got stuck over in the Senate and they, they didn't take it up. Uh, I would support that again. We've, we've had hearings where we had children who that we know were able to be helped by it. They've gone to other states and purchased it and um, they were actually having seizures right in front of us. So it was like, you know, up to the minute that we got to see that. Um, as far as legalizing it for recreational, I, I, I've never been in support of that, but I have watched what other states are doing. We don't need the revenue from that uh, at this time. 
but um, I, I would like to wait and see. I, I'm hearing feedback from other states, and so I'd like to see what maybe the unintended consequences are. But right now, other states, when I go to national meetings, are saying it's going well. Ms. Cruz. Yeah, um, 30 states, 38 states have already legalized marijuana at, at some level. And so um, many of those states started with uh, medical marijuana, and it is a valid treatment. It, it really has helped so many people. It treats, uh, uh, it's a, it treats pain, it treats um, seizures. seizures, and um, it is, it's a valid medical treatment. So that might be a good place to start. Um, fortunately, we do have the ability to learn from the other states who have already implemented it and implemented um, recreational marijuana as well. And I, I would, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm not, I'm not convinced that it is a gateway drug in the classic sense. I just, it, it's, it, it just, I, I haven't seen that information. Um, Colorado just last year made $423 million in marijuana tax revenue, and a lot of this is being channeled into the states. Oh, sorry. But of course there are challenges to deal with. I mean, there are problems with it. So, and we can learn from other states. Thank you to everyone for your questions tonight. We will now allow the candidates. We will now allow the candidates to make a one-minute closing and we will begin with Mr. Jones. Well, thank you for uh, putting this on. It's great to be in Salina. Uh, some of the best Italian food in the state. <laughs> uh, um, and being in the arts, uh, Steeple Theater is, is a place I've gone several times, as well as the Art Academy right around the corner um, in that area. So um, I'm a strong supporter of public education. In Western Kansas, in my district that is primarily rural, we have to have a quality public education system. Um, and there's a push to do away with it. Um, and I strongly support it. It has to be quality. I, we are the first board that is conditionally accrediting school districts for not, not doing that or not having plans to address it. Uh, we have conditionally accredited three public school districts in the state of Kansas. And this year, I've, as a preview for next week, we're about to get a bunch, uh, some big ones next week that'll come out. So we are holding school districts accountable for, for their successes. We expect greatness, uh, and we are working toward that. And I would appreciate your vote on August 2nd. <laughs> Ms. McCann. Thank you. Um, well, I'm trying to look at my notes here to see if there's anything I missed. Um, I've been endorsed by the Kansas Farm Bureau and Kansans for Life. Um, and um, I, I want to follow up on the education funding. I, I believe we need to fully fund schools. We are ratcheting up, up to the point, but we also need to fully fund special ed, and, and we are not at this at this time. Um, uh, I wanted to mention that some of those uh, numbers I said about housing. So we, um, before I knew Salina would be in my district, we put into the budget $5 million to help with a housing uh, project that's going in. Um, Great Plains is, is uh, cooperating with that, and it's going in on Crawford Street, and uh, that will be in my district. And so I was pretty excited when I found out that that area was going. So I helped when it came to the omnibus that we up that another $20 million. So we've got $25 million coming to Salina. Oh my gosh, my time is up. And I didn't even get to the other three or four, but we'll talk later. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I work in the field of death and dying and after death care. And one of the most important skills that I have learned working with people who are dying and with their families is the art of listening. So people from all walks of life die. And I've worked with all of them. Republicans, Democrats, Christians, atheists, you know, everyone. And none of that matters at end of life. I've learned how to listen to what makes people's lives meaningful, about what concerns them most, and what really matters. And I think that I will bring that unique and compassionate skill of listening to 
the job if I am given the privilege of representing the 69th district. And Ms. Malia. I also want to thank you guys for letting me feel like I'm finally getting heard. My friends are getting heard because I'm speaking for them. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm like talking for them, but it does feel like I finally get a chance to say what we want. And we want more control, or more, we want control of our body when it's about um, the abortion rights and having control, you know, of what we discuss with our doctors should be between us, and that is our right. Um, same thing, uh, I feel like the legalizing marijuana would help in a lot of ways instead of, I feel like keeping it illegal destroys the community itself. You're punishing people who might need it. You're it could go into financing a lot of things. It can help uh, farms, um, creating more jobs out there for them for that. There's a lot of things I just can't think of. Sorry, I got to fly. Fly. <laughs> fly. So I get more perfume because I like fruity stuff. Um, I lost my place, but there's a lot to it, and I want to talk about, I remember I didn't really get a chance, but I also want to talk about homeless out again. <laughs> All right, thank you again to everyone who was a part of our primary candidates forum. Uh, you can watch the recording again on Smoky Hills PBS Facebook page, uh, the League of Women Voters uh, dot dash Salina Kansas Facebook page, youtube.com slash Salina Media Connection, and the website lwbsalina.org. We remind you again that not only are these candidates on the ballot on August 2nd, but the constitutional amendment concerning abortion is also on the August 2nd ballot. Every registered voter in Kansas, whether a member of any party or no party, is eligible to vote on that issue. July 12th is the final day to register for that election. You can register to vote at ksvotes.org. We urge every eligible voter to register by July 12th and every registered voter to vote either in advance or on August 2nd. Thank you everyone and good night.